everybody. How you doing? I'm doing great. Isn't this something? Isn't this a great weekend? I want to thank the committee for having me, and I want to thank the committee for doing such a great job of putting on this wonderful convention. They deserve it, don't they? Good job. I've done these a time or two, never to the size that this one is, but I've done it, and uh, it takes a lot of effort on everybody's part. And it's always brought to surface my character defects <laughs> without fail. So um, I get to grow from everything that I've gotten to do as part of my service work in Al-Anon. Anyway, my name is Juanita, and I'm a very, very grateful family member of the Al-Anon family groups. And um, I'm really, really glad to be here. I truly am. And it was a pleasure to get to meet Kathy and spend some time with her. And it did take us a while. I have a daughter. Our youngest daughter lives here in Nashville with her husband and our youngest grandchild, who is four. And his name is Otis. And um, he's the light of my life. He's number eight. The oldest grandchild is 23. They go down to him, who's four. And um, we, we bought a house about a month ago. I, I, I turned to my husband. I don't think he's recovered from it yet. But I turned to him sometime in October of last year, and I said, what do you think about buying a house in Nashville? And he said, sounds pretty good. Well, he's the kind that you have to talk about things, and he talks things out, and he talks things out loud as he processes. I'm the kind that when I say it, it's done. <laughs> it's done. And that's one of the things that we've had to learn in our marriage. You know, I used to think that he would say something, and, he, and it's like, Oh my God, okay, he loves this place, we're moving here. This is crazy, I have a job, you know, I've got a retirement, he has no job, we know nobody, what's wrong with him? He's just talking, he's just talking, you know, he's just thinking about it, mulling it over, he doesn't intend anything. But I'm the kind of person that if I say it, it that's it. And, and, and when we talk, you know, when I get quiet, he used to think that I was just dissing him, you know? But I hear it, and I think about it, and sometimes it takes a little time, sometimes it takes hours, sometimes it takes a few days, and he thought I was just ignoring him, putting him down, not paying attention, but that's just who I am, that's the way I process, you know? And uh, so we've had to learn each other's styles. So when he said, yeah, sure, sounds pretty good to me, well, I started doing some investigating. And uh, we came out here in February and looked at a few places. And every time we put a, 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 um, uh, an offer in, it was, somebody else got it, so we knew that it wasn't the right house for us. And then uh, my daughter, who was dying for us to come and get a house here, she and our realtor found a place, and sight unseen, we bought it. And we'd look at each other and we'd go, we know what this looks like in inventory. <laughs> Why did I do this without looking at it? Came out here, looked at it, and I thought, oh my God, he's not going to like it. You know, because it wasn't about whether I liked it. In that moment, it was about whether he liked it and if he was going to like it. You see, the disease always comes up in little ways that I don't expect. It might not be today after 30 years about his drinking, but every once in a while it'll still come up about what's he going to say, what's he going to think. And so I'm going into this house and I'm thinking, not with my eyes, but I'm looking at it with his eyes. That's the powerlessness of the disease of alcoholism for a family member. I never know what form it's going to take. So anyway, I bought it. Because you know what? My grandson, Otis, is more important than my hubby. <laughs> and he knows it. He knows it, right? He knows it. 
I love this kid. He calls me Granny. And everybody goes, oh my God, Granny? Tom says, don't let him call you Granny. My son-in-law says, does it bother you when he calls you Granny? I said, no, he can call me anything. I don't care. As long as he calls me, you know, I just, I don't care. All the kids, I don't give a darn what they call me, whatever. You know, they're, they're the light of my life. There was a time when I couldn't have even said this stuff to you because I would have been afraid of what Tom would think and of how he would feel. Because he might feel slighted, he might feel hurt. Because you see, my whole life, when I was in this disease, active disease of alcoholism, was about what he was going to say, what he was going to do, what he was going to think. I spent my time, I gave up my life to take care of his feelings. Elanon has given me a God who most of the time allows me to not take care of someone else's feelings, but to do what God would have me do. Years ago, I was driving home from a meeting, and I probably had about maybe five years in the program. And I was driving home, I was thinking about what God's vision for me is. And what I, I, I got this thought. Well, you know, you're Hispanic, you've got some Native American in you, and I can just imagine this little house where you live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and you're going to have it wide open for women and their children to come in. Just a little house, you know, where maybe you know, two or three women can come with their kids and they can heal from active alcoholism, and they can get better and they can find God. And I thought... That sounds like what God would have me do. Well, within six minutes, within six seconds, I'd gone nationwide. I had high rises all over the country. I mean, I was helping everybody. And I just thought, I started laughing at myself. And I said, really, is this really what God would have me do? And what I got was, what God would really have me do was to be the woman he would have me be. The wife, the mother, the daughter, the friend the employer, the employee. Just who he would have me be. To do my best. You see, I didn't come here thinking that it was just about doing my best. I came here thinking that I had to be number one. I had to be the best or I had to be the worst. When I sat with my first sponsor, she said to me one day, Honey, you can just be average. I don't do average. (laughs) I don't know about you, but average did not fit in my vocabulary. I did great, number one, the best, or the worst. I was never average. I was always way above everyone, or I was way below. Never average. And what I've gotten in my time in Al-Anon is, I'm just average. I'm just average, and my job is just to be the best person God would have me be. So I sat this morning in some quiet time, and I do what I did what I always do before I speak, and I said, God, what would you have me share? Now, before I even put this out to God, and my quiet time started, the very first thing that came to me was family. And I thought, well, isn't that a little redundant, God? Because really, I mean, Al-Anon is a family disease. You know, it's alcoholism. It affects the whole family. And I kept getting, during my whole meditation, family, family, family. And I was like, well, what's this about? I don't know. I guess I'll just show up and see what God has to say. I did celebrate 30 years, July 2nd of this year. 30 years, I walked, 30 years ago, I walked into my first Al-Anon meeting, July 2nd of 1986. And I walked in there not because I wanted to, not because I thought it was a good idea, not because I thought I needed help. I walked in there because my husband had gone into treatment. And when he was at the treatment center, and they you know, were checking him in, and they said, and you have to go to at least three Al-Anon meetings before we let him out. 
I thought, I've been trying to get rid of this SOB for a long time. (laughs) You want him that bad? You can keep him. I had no intentions of going to an Al-Anon meeting. Thank you very much. I didn't know what they were, but I did not need them. So I went to my first family day. Now here's, you're going to love this. You family members are going to love this. He went in in 1986, the day before Father's Day. So when I'm leaving there on a Saturday, I took him on a Saturday, dropped him off, and um, the next day was was Father's Day, and he said, well, you're going to come back tomorrow. It's Father's Day. And I said, yeah, I don't think so, honey. And I could see that look on his face of disappointment. And you know what? That was my goal in life by this time, was to make him miserable. And I see some nods out there. I know I'm not alone. When I met him, he had two boys. They were five and seven. I had a daughter. She was six. I wanted us to be a happy family. I mean, I watched the Brady Bunch. I mean, really? Everybody got along together. And I thought, I want something like that. But the Brady Bunch didn't have something, at least, that we saw it. You know, I mean, on screen, everything's perfect. They have their little tiffs and everything's sorted out at the end of the hour. You know, we had alcoholism in our home. I grew up with active alcoholism. My, my father, I wouldn't call him an alcoholic, but he drank. And when he drank, let me tell you, it affected the whole family. It affected my mother, who got quiet, who didn't talk, who withdrew. And it affected me because I thought I had to be the perfect kid to make everything okay. I was the kid who had to take care of everything. Do nothing wrong. So we got married, Tom and I. I've, heard, I've gone to your Al Anon meetings here this weekend. They're fabulous. The recovery is tremendous here in this part of the country. I love it. I've loved our speakers. I heard Magdalena. If you didn't hear her, you've got to hear her story. I came in here a person who I didn't like. I couldn't stand myself. I always doubted that my husband loved me. And the reason I doubted that he loved me was because I didn't love myself. I didn't like myself. And if I didn't like me and I didn't love me, how could he love me? How could anyone love me? And you've taught me how to do that. We had yours, his boys, and we had mine, my daughter. We got married, and we had ours. We had yours, mine, and ours. And it was not the Brady Bunch. Because you throw alcohol into that mix, and what happens is nastiness. It's not pleasant. And I hate to say this, but I used my kids against him. I thought he was crazy. I thought he was mean. I thought he didn't love me or love us. Really, God, I asked you to lighten it up. Oh, well, here we go. I thought he didn't love us. I used my kids in ways that diminished him as a person. We have a thing in one of our daily readers that talks about to kill a man's spirit is one of the most evil things we can do. And I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was slowly killing my husband's spirit and, I was, and as I was doing that, I was slowly killing my children's spirit and, of course, my own. 
because you can't do that to someone else that you don't do it to yourself. And I was clueless. Clueless. You don't know what you don't know. I would make him take our kids sometimes on a weekend. And if he wasn't drinking, I knew he would be. (coughs) Excuse me. And I thought if anything goes wrong, if he has an accident, then he'll see how bad he is. There's nothing wrong with me. Something wrong with him. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in the doctor's opinion says, the alcoholic is in full flight from reality. What about me? (coughs) Excuse me, I've got a little something going on. (coughs) If the alcoholic is in full flight from reality, what does that say about me? Because I'm chasing after him hard and fast and I'm trying to stay ahead of him there's no way I'm catching up every time I think I am I'm miles behind miles behind I don't even know it you don't know what you don't know I think I'm being responsible I think I'm being a good parent He's the slacker. I got that ha- got that halo. Only I don't realize it's a pretty tarnished, nasty looking halo. There ain't nothing shiny about it. There's something in one of our readers, Al Anon readers, that says self righteousness self righteousness can do more damage and keep us further from God than any other character defect. I was full of self-righteousness. There's nothing wrong with me. Compare me to him. I look pretty good. Until you look inside. So I walk in to my first Al-Anon meeting because I've gone to family day. And I want to go back to the next family day and look like the loving, caring, supportive wife that I'm not. I want those counselors to know that anything that went wrong in our family had nothing to do with me because I follow directions. It was all him. They asked me one time in family, in a a private um, session, what do you like to do? And the counselor walked out of the room, and I sat there, and I went into tears. And Tom said, why are you crying? He said, I was always faithful to you. I never went out on you with other women. And I said, honey, I said, you might not have gone out with other women, but I was never first. Alcohol was always first. I couldn't fight Isn't there a country song about that? Can't fight, can't fight the booze. It'll always win. I can't remember the words, but I know it's out there. (laughs) You can trust a country western song to put something about everything, you know? And, um, but as I sat there, I thought, I don't know what I like to do. I could tell you what he liked to do. I could tell you what my kids like to do. I could tell you what my family members like to do or my friends. I was clueless about me. I knew nothing about me. Several years in the program, I found myself saying, this program has given me back my life. That's not true. This program didn't give me back my life. This program gave me life. I had no life. Alcohol stole that from me. I remember being a little bitty girl at the age of four, going to Grandma's house. My Grandma had this little teeny tiny adobe house. Grandma had no running water in her house. Grandma had some electricity. Her heat came from a wood stove. 
Her plumbing was all outdoors. You had to hike to the well and you had to hike to the bathroom. But Grandma would wake me up in the morning. She said, Mijita, let's go for water. And we'd walk to the well. And she would help me get the bucket off the well. And we'd lower it into the, into the well. And when it hit the water and we let it fill, she'd help me pull it back up. And I was excited about life in those days. I would... Really? A bucket? At my house, you turn on the tap and the water comes out. You never knew what was going to come up with that bucket. <laughs> I know some of you know. Sometimes there'd be a water spider. Once in a while, there might be a little frog in there. It sounds pretty gross to, to hear it, but it's true. And that was cool. When you're four years old, like my grandson Otis, you're on fire for life. You're on fire for life. Life is exciting. What's going to happen next? And living with active alcoholism one day at a time, that was stolen from me. My father didn't intend to do that. My father was the most loving, caring man. He loved me without a question. I just couldn't see it because it didn't look the way I thought it should look. And my mother loved me, but I couldn't see it because it didn't look the way I thought it should look from a little teeny tiny age. I came in here, and what I heard was how horrible life had been. And what I remembered, because this is what living with active alcoholism does to someone like me, is I remember all the horrible bad times. I totally disregarded the good stuff. There was no good stuff. There were no good times. You see, that's the delusion of this disease. I can't tell what's real and what's a lie. I can only remember those things that feed that sense of it's all you who's wrong. And it's all you who are to blame, not me. Not me. Not me. That's what the disease does. And it does it to us whether we're the family member, whether we're the alcoholic. It does it to us so slowly we don't even know it's happening. And then I came in here, and I hear what I want to hear. I want to hear that I have the ability to blame, and it's their fault. Because I don't want to take responsibility for my life. I don't want that. I want somebody else to take the responsibility. It's too hard. I don't want to be a grown-up. I don't want to look at me. I want everybody else to change so that I'll be okay. Everybody changes so I'll be okay. Thirty years later, looking back, I am so grateful, so grateful that I kept coming back and that I came into Elena for all the wrong reasons. At that first meeting, I thought, there's nobody here who can help me. They all looked like housewives. They looked like old hippies. They looked like professional people, dressed nicely. None of them could help me. I knew that the housewives were stuck in, I mean, it's like, really? The old hippies, been there, done that. Professional people, I was a professional woman. I was an accountant. You don't talk about the stuff that goes on at home because they don't understand, because they don't live the kind of life I was living. So they couldn't help me. But I went because I got to look good, got to look good. And I sat there and I felt sorry for you poor, pathetic people. <laughs> you talked about God 
and I wanted to crawl under the table. Because don't you know it's God that put me here? Don't you know it's God who's been playing with me as though I were a puppet? Just moving me around, going, ha, 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 got you now. That's what I thought of God. If I thought of God. Most of the time I didn't really want to think about God. Because if I did, I knew that it was a God that was going to punish me and send me to hell for the things that I'd done and the things I hadn't done. It was not a kind, loving, caring, benevolent God that I had in my life. It was a cruel, punishing God that was messing with me. So I sat in that meeting. And finally, one woman spoke and she said, I came here today for my first meeting because I want to know how to get my husband into treatment. And I thought, finally somebody, finally somebody puts it out there and talks about what this is about. So she finished, and I promptly raised my hand. And I say, el made its first mistake. They called on me. And I proceeded to tell them all how to get your husband into treatment, because I thought I had done it. And when I finished sharing, they all said, thank you for sharing, keep coming back. <laughs> and I thought, I will, because you poor pathetic losers recognize that you need me. <laughs> keep coming back, right? I mean, that's the arrogance. That's my arrogance. I'm never, I'm never average. I'm better than or I'm worse, right? And you needed me. I did not need you, but I keep coming back because I'd been to family day and I had something I could really give you. <laughs> you poor, pathetic losers. <laughs> and I kept coming back and I picked up the lingo. I never intended to get any recovery. I took Tom home after 35 days there He was one of those people that had to stay longer than the uh, prescribed time. <laughs> and I was petrified. Because I didn't know who this man was. I only knew him drunk and high. And I didn't know who he was sober. And I thought... He's going to live with me for a few days, maybe a few weeks. And then he's going to take a look at me one day and he's going to say, what in the world am I doing with this loser? Because I didn't think I was tall enough, thin enough, pretty enough, smart enough, rich enough, obviously, witty enough. And I knew every single woman in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous had all the enoughs. And it didn't matter how old you were, didn't matter how you looked, you had the enoughs that I did not have. And I was scared to death. Because I didn't know how to live my life. For me. He was my life. He was my obsession he was all I thought about. I remember the days when he would, when, it was horrible in our home. You all know what it's like. It's never pre pleasant. We come into meetings and everybody's, our new people coming in, they don't want to bring their kids because God knows what they're going to hear. What the hell are you talking about? What do you think they hear at home? What do you think they see? Right? I didn't know who he was. And I'm petrified. He's going to leave. So I picked up the lingo. I spouted it really well. I could say it all. I sounded good. 
And at the end of two years of going to meetings, and I went to every meeting we had. Back then, in my little hometown in Santa Fe, we had three meetings a week, and I went to every one. And I sounded good. And people started asking me to sponsor them, and I said, absolutely. You, <laughs> you poor, pathetic loser. Yeah, who's the poor, pathetic loser? And one day I was at a meeting, and I had spent the weekend before writing some inventory. I knew nothing about inventory. But I'd seen those steps on the wall. You know, we have those shades on the wall, and they've got the steps, and then there's the one with the traditions, and then there's the one with the concepts. And so I had, I had worked those steps. If you had asked me, have you worked those steps, I would have said, you bet I have. And I had. I worked those steps off the wall, off that window shade. And I had an off-the-wall program. <laughs> and I had an off-the-wall life. And my relationships were off the wall. I was a basket case, and I didn't even know it. But I'd written inventory that weekend, and I didn't realize I'd written inventory because I didn't like me. I thought I was writing inventory because of what he had done and because of what my parents had done, that miserable, horrible, terrible childhood I'd had. That's why I was writing inventory. So I turned around, and I meant to ask this woman at this meeting if she would listen to my inventory. And the words that came out were not, would you listen to this fifth step? The words that came out were, will you sponsor me? And I was so shocked at those words that I, I literally looked around to see who had said those. <laughs> you ever done something like that? And she said, well, let's meet this weekend and we'll talk. And so we did. I left there and I thought, what in the world did you do? You see, I don't ask anybody for help. I don't need help. I'm the one who helps. Tom and I joke. We say in AA, the AA the war cry is, what about me? And an Ellen on the war cry is, I was just trying to help. <laughs> I want to be needed. And don't we all, don't we want that? I just want to be needed. That woman started taking me through the 12 steps. I told her I wanted to write, I, I had an inventory. She says, why did you ask me to sponsor you? And I said, well, I have this little inventory that I wanted you to read. And she got quiet for a minute. And I will tell you that whenever a person with time in this program gets quiet, be careful because you're about to hear something you don't want to hear. <laughs> she got quiet and she said, oh, honey, she said, this program, and they always start it with, oh, honey, don't they? <laughs> now I do the oh, honeys. And she said, oh, honey, she said, this program is not meant to be worked alone. She says, if I'm going to sponsor you, she says, we're going to start with step one. And she said, and it's going to be a commitment. She says, what I mean by that is, because I started to say, absolutely, yeah, I'll do whatever you want. She says, you go home and you think about it and you pray about it. She says, because I'm going to commit my time to you. And I expect you to commit your time to me. And how we're going to do this thing is you're going to go to at least three meetings of Al-Anon a week. I was, always do I was doing that. That's no problem. And she said, I want you to go to at least one AA meeting every two weeks. And she said, the reason I require this is that you have to know you don't have the only alcoholic in town. You don't have the worst one. You don't have the best one. You just have one. <laughs> and she said, and you don't have any compassion for the alcoholic. And you need to find that. And was she ever right? 
I had no compassion for anyone. I couldn't see anyone's pain but my own. When I got to you January 2nd of 1986, I could not have given two cents for any of you. It was my family that was most important. I didn't have anything to give. Any, I didn't know it. I didn't have anything to give my family. If you had asked me right then and there, what's the most important thing to you, I would have said it's my children. But you see, you can't listen to my words. You have to watch my actions. And my actions did not match my words. You know who was most important? The alcoholic. Everything revolved around him. Everything. He said to me one day, I see how miserable I'm making you. I see how miserable I'm making the kids. I'll leave. And I said, you cannot go. You can't go. I didn't know how to have my life without him. Didn't know how to do it. I couldn't live with him, and I couldn't live without him. Didn't know how to do it. Sacrificed my kids. So that maybe he'd see he'd be okay. Maybe he'd see that there was something wrong with him. Well, he got sober, man, and he loved AA. Loved AA. I was not too happy with you. (laughs) But I was not too happy with anyone. Got this sponsor. I got her, I realized because I did not like who I was. I could not stand me. I have to blame you and hold you responsible and criticize you because I cannot bear to look at myself. I cannot bear to look at the things that I've done and the damage I have done to my children, to my loved ones to him. I never wanted to admit that I caused harm to him. But I did. I broke down his spirit. I broke down my children's spirit. God says I'm supposed to talk to you about family. My family, because of these 12 steps that Alcoholics Anonymous has shared with Al-Anon. And we didn't want him. Lois didn't want him. She didn't want the responsibility. She's like, I can, hear, I can imagine her too. Seriously, Bill? <laughs> Haven't I done enough? You want me to do what? I'm putting up with your old meetings. Don't we have drunks living here all the time? I've always got the coffee pot going. And now you want me to do what? Bill begged her to take these 12 steps because the families needed them. And isn't it harder to get the families in here than it is to get the AAs Because there's nothing wrong with us. Because we're the responsible ones. Because we look good compared to the alcoholics. I don't know about anybody else, but I was sicker than he was. In the doctor's opinion of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, it says in there, Thought just left me. Give me a second. Well, it'll come back. God, 
but I want it so bad because it was a gem. <laughs> oh, well. Maybe it'll come out. Maybe it won't. Where was I? Anyway, so it's about family. My family has changed. Because of these 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, my family has changed. These 12 steps gave me the ability to take a look at me, to see my faults. Every time I start to blame somebody or criticize something or someone, I know it's not them. It's never them. No matter what. Sorry. Let me say this again. It's never them. Doesn't matter what it is they did. It's never them. It's always me. Yeah, but it's never them. What am I doing? What's up with me? You see, working my first inventory took away the pleasure of my resentments. I could no, didn't take them away, but I could no longer have a resentment that I didn't know I had something to do with it. What am I up to? You want to know what one of my worst character defects is? Well, first of all, I don't invite God in, right? That's the first one. But I keep my mouth shut. I don't talk. It's the first thing. Don't talk. Keep my mouth shut. Everybody thinks everything's fine and wonderful. Everybody, he thinks I agree with him. I think he's crazy. But I don't say anything because I don't want to rock the boat piece at any price, right? And here's the kicker. I can use the program to reinforce that. If you can't say anything nice, don't say nothing. Silence is golden. If you can't improve on silence, And the truth behind all of this, the fear behind all that, is that I'm afraid that I'm going to have to deal with someone's emotions. I'm afraid I'm going to have to deal with someone's reactions. I don't want to do that. I'll take it all on. I'll be quiet. I can deal with it. Who made me God? I take care of their emotions by keeping silent. Nobody has to change. Nobody has to grow. Nobody has to do anything different. I'll adjust me. A friend of mine who's passed away said, you al are thieves. He said, you are thieves of the worst type because you steal our experience. You steal the alcoholic's experience. I steal their opportunity to grow. I steal their opportunity to get closer to God. Why? Because I will take care of your feelings. I'll change. Doesn't mean I don't have to change. I have to change. But not in the way I thought. I have to learn to speak up. I don't like doing that. And I use my culture as an excuse. In my culture, we don't do that. You watch and you're respectful. And you don't embarrass anybody. You don't say anything that's going to hurt somebody. I remember I had that conversation with my husband one time when I was trying to make amends. When I made amends, not try, I was making amends. And I said, honey, I said, I've got to tell you, I had a resentment. And he goes, well, what do you mean? What about? And I said, well, I realized that I haven't been honest with you. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I, f I said, I found this fear that I can't say anything to anybody if it's going to hurt them, if it's going to embarrass them. Said, well, that's pretty good. And I said, it's good until I, re I use it to build a wall between us. See what I'm saying? And there were walls. There were walls on walls. No one knew me. He didn't know me. My family didn't know me. Because I'm quiet. 
I don't reveal my true self to you. Because I'm afraid that if I do, you won't like me. You won't like me. You'll have nothing to do with me. I was scared to death when I got here and for years after that my children would be angry with me. And if they're angry with me and they're not involved in my life, I couldn't bear the pain. Once they had children, if they got angry with me, they'd keep their kids away from me and I couldn't bear the pain. I had to find a God that was greater than all that fear I had. You see, my God grows and changes. Okay, God doesn't grow and change, but where I let God in grows and changes. I have to see those places where I haven't let God in. And I think I've let God into everywhere. After 30 years, there's not any place. There's still places. This program taught me that what I have to do is get that flashlight of truth and shine it into those dark places to see what I don't know. Because I don't know what I don't know. The question is, do I want to know it? Or am I going to stay here and be comfortably uncomfortable? And I think that's why we lose those family members coming in. Because there's somewhere deep inside of us that we know we have to do something different. Don't want to. Because the family won't approve. They won't like it. My parents never got this AA and Al and on deal. Never. But I will tell you that I was 46 years old when my mother on my birthday had us all, had the whole family to her house, and she said to me in the kitchen, first time she's ever said it, and I'm 46 years old, she says, Mijita, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you. She was proud of the woman that you all had been working on for years. She was proud of the woman that working these 12 steps was turning me into. The woman that God would have me be. My dad, when we would go to meetings, go away for conferences, he'd come to me and he'd say, Mijita, I know you're going, he says, but I just wanted to hug you and kiss you and tell you I love you. I'm on my second sponsor. My first sponsor let me go. She said, you have to find somebody else because I've only worked the steps up to the eighth step and I can't take you further. I was sponsorless for years. Well, at least a year, maybe two. Doing service work, sponsoring people, and doing a pretty good job of it and going to meetings. I really was. I was doing pretty darn good. I was doing pretty darn good. Until one day, I then daughter who was 12, had these mice. And when you have mice, they have mice, and the mice have mice. No, I mean, it's like, <laughs> you got mice. And what happens to mice when they're in a, in a little enclosed space is that they become cannibalistic. And our daughter one day witnessed this, and she came running out of her room and said, we've got to get rid of these mice. I can't. So we were up to, going up to the mountains on a Saturday and get rid of the mice, release them up into the, in the mountains. And my husband, he's so sweet. I mean, really, it was really sweet, and I couldn't see it. He said, we stopped at a pet store because he wanted to stop at a pet store. And I'm like, really, he never wants to stop at pet stores. And he said, don't you think a little bigger cage and she could keep these mice? Because it's really helped her, and she's become responsible. I mean, he was really caring and thinking about her, and I'm like, we're getting rid of these mice, dude. And we ended up staying there about two hours, and you know, finally I'm saying, let's go get rid of these mice. We're going up the mountain, and he says again, for what I think is the 50th time, Juana, don't you think we ought to just get a bigger cage? I mean, the, the, she's really been good with him. And I lost it. I lost it, and I grabbed hold of that steering wheel, and I yanked that steering wheel as hard as I could, 
And if he hadn't been paying attention, we would have gone over the edge. Five, six years in the program. He starts yelling, what in the world is going on? What's the matter with you? Our daughter who's in the back seat with the mice says, Mama, Mama, bet Daddy, what's wrong? What's going on? And she's crying and she's hysterical. Tom pulls over and I'm thinking, what in the world is wrong with you? What in the world is wrong with you? It's never them. We got rid of the mice. <laughs> My husband's no fool. He knows a crazy woman when he sees one. <laughs> Next day I sat in quiet and I said, God, what in the world happened to me? God always answers my questions. Always. I often hear at meetings, I asked God, but I didn't get anything back. Oh, bull. If you ask and you want the answer, you're going to get it. But it's easier to say God didn't give you the answer because it's not the answer you want. When I want an answer and I ask God and I mean it, I always get the answer. And I got my answer. You quit working those steps. And the disease wants you. And it'll take you, and it'll take your family, and it doesn't matter what in the world you're doing, how much service work you do, how many people you sponsor, it's there. Because you are not doing the steps. Well, I got a sponsor. It was my husband's sponsor. He volunteered me to take a trip with her to Colorado, and I was so angry with him. How could you dare volunteer me? And I didn't know how to back out of it. She might not like me. And you've got to have your, spon- your husband's sponsor like you. So on my way to this conference, I'm a vision of al Serenity. <laughs> I am the perfect little al her truck breaks down and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you're sponsoring my husband and you don't even have a truck that works. But I don't say it. What comes out of my mouth is, God will take care of it. <laughs> this too shall pass. <laughs> and she says to me, you're so right and here we are and blah, blah, blah. On the way back, I'm a babbling idiot my true colors and she says honey you need a bigger God I said what do you mean and she says the God that you have has been enough to get you here but this God is not enough to take you where you have to go we've already heard it this weekend you either grow or you go you grow or you go I never wanted to be Miss Goody Two-Shoes. Never. Still don't. But this program doesn't ask me to be good. This program asks me to do God's will. That's all. I sit in quiet, I sit in prayer and meditation, and I say, God, what is your will for me today? Just today. I had a sponsee call me a few days ago, and she says, I, we were talking, I said, Honey, it's, t- it's 10 o'clock there. Today's done with. Say, thank you, God. Even if you thank you, I said, thank God it's over. She goes, well, what about tomorrow? I said, I don't know. We'll see tomorrow. I do God's will today. Today. I'll tell you that today, 30 years later, we're still not the Brady Bunch. We're not the Huxtables. But we're pretty darn good. We're pretty darn good. This program doesn't promise me that life is going to be perfect. But it promises me that I'm going to have a God 
that will manage my life if I will just let him. The question is, will I let him? Okay, God, I made up taking matters into my own hand and getting the house here in Nashville. (sighs) But even God can use something like that. You see, there was a time when I was afraid. I wrote down inventory, and my fear was, what if, I, what if I misinterpret God's will for me? You ever had that fear? If you haven't, you will. <laughs> and what I got was, God will take anything and turn it to gold if you just let him. God has taken the disease of alcoholism and turned it into gold in my life. My kids, today they're, I don't know, I think they're 44, 43, 42, and 35. They talk to us. They got something going on in their life. Guess who they call? My oldest son just graduated from nursing school last year. He works at the emergency room in the town where we live. He gives out his father's number to those people who come in dying of alcoholism. How do you get from where we were at to that? My grandson Carter, who's 19, he drove out with me from Santa Fe to Nashville. We had the greatest time traveling together. It was a two-day drive. I was a little nervous at first. I mean, you know, I mean, a 19-year-old with his 60-year-old grandma. We had a great time. We talked about everything. And we had those periods of silence that were not uncomfortable. They were just comfortable. And if you can't have those quiet silences and be comfortable, something's wrong. We listened to music. I told him, oh, honey, forget listening to it on your headphones. Just plug it in. And it was great music for a while. He said, Grandma, we'll, we'll, I'll put on something that we'll both like. And then after a while, I started getting a little. And I said, I think we've heard enough, honey. And he goes, you're right. He told, he told his, um, my daughter, he said, yeah, grandma's, Grandma was listening to it, and it's pretty good. And it started getting a little raunchy. And you know, that's about when Grandma said, I think we've heard enough, Carter. And he said, it was, it was okay. I think they want their limits. You know, I want him to be comfortable with grandma, but I don't want him that comfortable. (laughs) Know what I mean? He said to my daughter's friend, my grandma loves me just the way I am. She thinks I'm great. My relationship with my grandkids is really sweet. I'm just grandma. They know I've got them. Tom said to me, you'd give him anything, wouldn't you? And I'd say, yes. I would give him anything I could give him. I'll give him anything in this world if I have the ability to give him. I was crying this morning. Tom said, what's going on? I didn't want to tell him. So I'll tell you all. (laughs) This is how he hears half the stuff anyway. (laughs) My friend Libby, when my father passed away, I was going to go speak, uh, do a weekend. And I said, oh, Libby, I said, I don't want to do this. I'm so raw. And she says, oh, she says, that's so good. You do your best work when you're raw. (laughs) I don't want to leave my grandson. I don't want to leave. And it doesn't diminish the love I have for the other ones. But his is just, he's at that age or he's got that pure, sweet love. The age of four, where you're walking down the street with him and he looks up and doesn't even look up, just says, as a matter of fact, I love you. 
We're all born with that. We're all born with that childlike quality. We were down in Florida visiting, visiting family, and there was this little sticker on this door, and it said, you can't steal my happy. And I took a picture of it, and I thought, I want that to make, I want to make that my thing in life. You can't steal my happy. And nobody can steal our happy, but I can give it away. I'll just throw it away at the drop of a hat. I don't want to steal anyone's happy. And I love my grandchildren. They have that beautiful childlike quality. We didn't do it. God did it. God turned our children into parents who could be there for their kids. And that's not to say they're perfect, believe me, because there's times that I, I cringe and I want to say, oh my God, how can you do that? How can you say that? And I go back at night and I take a look at it and I go, I know where they got that from. I called my sponsor the other day and I said, you know, this is what, uh, this is what I saw with my daughter and I saw with my grandson. And I said, and it reminded me of me in the old days. It reminded me of me. I get frustrated, I get angry, I get upset. And who did I take it out on? I took it out on my kids. I never want to do that ever again. But I'm human. And I know I will. I know I will. I'm not perfect. We're not asked to be perfect. We're just asked to keep doing better and better and better. Spiritual progress. My kids know they got they they know we, they got us behind them. There's nothing Tom and I wouldn't do for our children. My sponsor said to me, "There's that part in the big book that says a better demonstration lies in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. It's easy to be loving and caring and kind to you all." It's easy. You don't expect anything in return. I've done nothing to harm you. <coughs> nothing. I'll tell you a little bit, spend some time with you, we'll chat. You go, man, she's terrific. Years ago I realized I don't want to die and have all my family and all my friends there, program people, whatever, and have all the program people in my life say, wasn't she great? Oh, she really helped me. And I didn't want to have my kids looking at each other going, Oh, I don't think of... I, she wasn't that hot. <laughs> I didn't think that much of her. It was always about them and never about us. Our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. The hardest place to do this program is in our homes. My first sponsor, Kay, said to me, if you don't have a program at home, you don't have a program. If you don't have a program at home, you don't have a program. You're easy. I've caused harm with my kids. I caused harm with my parents. I caused harm with my husband. There was a time when I said, he'll never change. He'll never change the way I want him to change. He'll never be the person I want him to be, and thank God for that. Because I would diminish him as a person. My job is to pray for him and ask God to make him open to be the best person that God would have him be. And that's what I do with my children, and that's what I do with my grandchildren. That's the best prayer I can offer anyone. I want you to be open to get 
all that you can get from the God of your understanding so that you can be all you can be. So that when we go to bed at night, we can go, this was a good day. I put something good into this day. It wasn't just take, take, take. I heard an old timer say one time, we are takers. We take and we take and we take and we take. And until we learn how to give, we don't stand a chance. Oh, yeah, but we're family members. That's all we've done is give, right? We give and we give and we give. Yeah, but it was never for fun or for free, was it? It was always with an expectation. What am I going to get out of it? When's my turn? Where's mine? You see, it's not just the alcoholic, is it? What about me? There was a time when I was... um, I went to a psychiatrist at my first sponsor's request because I had this little problem with jealousy. And she said, I don't know what to do with you anymore. So I went and... After a few sessions, what he finally said to me was, I want you to go home and I want you to be the kindest, most loving, caring wife you can be. Got home and I called my sponsor and I said, do you know what that SOB said? And she says, I haven't a clue. And she said, he said to me, and she got, she got quiet. And she said, honey, you're paying him $125 an hour. Why don't you try doing what he says? I never realized it. So I did. I started calling it my hit and run. I'd give him hugs. I'd give him pecks in the cheek. I'd call him honey. And I'd run. Did never look back because I didn't want to see the look on his face. I was afraid I'd get like a disgusted look or roll his eyes or something. And one day he says something to me and he said, don't you think deer or something? And I stopped dead in my tracks and I thought, oh my God, I never thought this would happen. And I would have thought that that was the miracle. That was not the miracle. The miracle was that I was starting to change and I was doing these things without anything, the need to have anything in return. That's the miracle. Our relationship has changed. We're good friends. I'm good friends with my kids. I love them. They know I love them. I have given them permission to be real. Not, yes, mom, okay, mom, but to be real. And I've given myself permission to be real. Not perfect. My sponsor used to say to me, when are you going to finally have an honest relationship? And I'd say, what do you mean? She says, they don't know you. Nobody knows you. You keep it all locked up inside you. It's all in here. Nobody knows who you are. I come here to tell my story First thing I do is I ask God to open up my heart, my mind, and my spirit so that nothing's blocking me from you. An old friend of mine said to me one day when I told him I had an amends that I had to make, amends I kept forgetting about, and they would come to me, and then I'd forget about it, and they would come to me. And he said to me, he said, honey, he didn't say honey, he just, he was, he said, I highly suggest that you go back home and you make that amends immediately. He said, because if there's something between you and another person, there's something between you and God. I try to keep my side of the street clean. I do my absolute very best to make amends so that there's nothing between me and another human being. To my knowledge, I can say that that's true today. Because I want nothing between me and my God. My relationship with the God of my understanding.
understanding is so special. It is so deep. I treasure it. I want nothing to come between us. I can't afford it. I will do damage if I'm not united with the God of my understanding. My God loves me so much, though, that when I do make a mistake, he just kind of pats me on the head and he says, it's okay, honey, if you leave things alone and let me get in there, I can take care of it. And he always does. He always does. I'm not the woman I came in here. I'm a woman that has an open heart today. Most of the time. I still have those instances where I want to close it because I don't want to be hurt. Don't want to be hurt. But I have the kind of God that when I have feelings that are overwhelming, I sit in the quiet and I say, God, I can't bear this. This feeling is too big for me. This situation is too big for me. What you ask is too big for me. I can't do it. I'm just, I'm just a baby. So I give it to you. And you carry me through it. He always does. Always does. I didn't know I was going to get that here. I had no idea. All because an alcoholic by the name of Bill, begged his wife to take those 12 steps and share it with the families because we were dying. We were dying and didn't know it. You see, everything I've done has been for the wrong reason because I think you need me. And the truth is, I need you so very much more than you need me. You carry me. You carry me in your thoughts. You carry me in your prayers. I couldn't have walked the journey I walked in helping my father in his last year of life and helping my mother through hers. We become friends. We become family. I had the pleasure in February of helping my longest sponsee. I'd sponsored her for, I don't know, 23 years. She'd suffered for the last 16, 17 years um, with um, lupus. And for the past year and a half, she'd been ready to leave this world. But she's like many of us. She couldn't bear the thought of leaving her husband and leaving her children and the feelings that they'd have to go through. She stuck around for them. She really did. She stuck around for them. And one day she said to me, she says, I'm going to ask Bill to take me home because I just can't do this anymore. And I said, I know, sweetie. I know. It's okay. And I sat there by her bedside the day she passed away and... um. She said to me, they told me that I was going to get really tired and I was going to want to go to sleep and never, and and that I couldn't stay awake. And she says, I'm feeling like that now. Do you think this is the end? And I said, you know, Cease, I said, I don't know if this is it or not. I really don't. I know you've done a lot today. You've said goodbye to a lot of people because she used that opportunity to say goodbye to all the people she loved. She says, who gets this opportunity to say goodbye to everybody? And her house was filled with people coming in and out. That last day she said, God, I just wish everybody would stop coming. (laughs) You get what you ask for, and then you get it, and you're going like, oh, my God, you know? And I said, but I'll tell you, you've done a good job here. And I said, and you can rest. I said, your angels are around you. Look for your angels, cease. And she closed her eyes a time or two, and then she opened them, and when she opened them, she looked deep in my eyes. And I don't think it was me she was looking at. But I tried to show her through my eyes all the love that I knew 
I had for her and that God had for her. And I know it was only the smallest fraction. And when she closed her eyes for the last time, I knew that was it. We become family. I've watched some of you come and I've watched some of you go, both alcoholics and family members. I've loved some of you so deeply that when you leave, my heart breaks. And I don't mean just leave this world, I mean leave this fellowship. Because you think you've graduated or you don't need it. You're not alcoholic. And I want to get so angry at you. But it's really the disease I have to get angry at, isn't it? Because it's the disease that keeps on giving. It never stops. So I will keep coming and I'll keep doing this, even though I don't want to. And I think I'm here to tell you my story but I don't know if that's why I'm really here. And you might think you're here to hear me, but maybe that's not why you're really here. Maybe in a few days you'll get something that you go, I thought it was that, oh, but it's this. Because more will be revealed. If you're here, stay here. This is the world of infinite adventure. I thought it'd be boring. I've never had such excitement and tremendous possibilities in my life. God took the disease of alcoholism and turned it to gold. And from my heart to your heart, God bless you and I love you.